Good morning, Europe, and good evening, Australia, Asia. Good night, America, if someone from that region uh, would attend, which is maybe unlikely. I guess these people will rather uh, uh, watch the YouTube recording afterwards. Um, I start this session with some technical remarks. We are in a Zoom uh, webinar. This session is being recorded. Uh, and video and audio options for the audience are disabled unless uh, these options are changed for you by the moderator of this session. Uh, another technical uh, remark is that you can post your questions uh, not in the chat function, which is rather for informal messages, uh, but in the Q&A function, which makes it more easy for the moderator to, to deal with your questions. And please, please also mention to whom you're addressing your question to the keynote speaker or to the respondent. So my name is Stein Latre. I'm the director of UXIA, which is the University Center St. Ignatius Antwerp. And welcome to this webinar entitled Alliance and Alignment in Times of Strategic Uncertainty. And uncertainty we are facing with the pandemic, and it's, a, it's also an uncertainty of a strategic nature, of course, debates about strategic resources and so on uh, are widespread uh, these days across the, the globe, I guess. So this is the third and last webinar in a series of three, which are in fact uh, online transformations of an international workshop, which was supposed to be held in Antwerp in 2020, but alas, due to reasons you're all too familiar with, this workshop was postponed now for the second time to some unknown date in the future. If it will ever take place physically in Antwerp at all, we intend to, but we never know what the pandemic uh, will bring us in the future. The first webinar was on security cooperation between Europe and the United States with Stephen Brooks as a keynote speaker and Sven Biskop and Tom Zauer as respondents. And the second session was on cooperation in the Asia Pacific region. And all information uh, on these previous sessions you can find on our website. You, so you're invited to revisit our website and also our YouTube channel to, to uh, view the recordings. So the second session was on cooperation in the Asia Pacific region with Yoshiro Sato as keynote speaker and Bryce Wakefield as respondent and Professor Elena Atanasova Cornelis as a moderator. And today's session is also chaired by Professor Elena Atanasova Cornelis, Senior Lecturer in International Relations of East Asia at the Department of Politics, University of Antwerp, and Professor Professeur at the School of Political and Social Sciences at University, the Catholic University of Leuven in the French speaking part of Belgium, so Université Catholique de Louvain, Luciel. Thank you, Professor, for introducing the speakers to us uh, in a a few seconds and for moderating uh, the Q&A of this session and the digital floor is now yours. Okay, good morning from Belgium to everyone and in particular welcome to Thomas from Australia. We would have liked so much to have you here in Belgium but of course the pandemic came and uh, uh, you know changed our plans. So at least we have the online option uh, to engage in a discussion. I would like first to um, introduce um, our main speaker, Thomas Wilkins, uh, today. Uh, so he is a uh, senior lecturer um, at the Department of Government and uh, International Relations uh, at the University of Sydney. Uh, he holds degrees, actually, I did not know, but now I know, from Birmingham University, bachelor's, master's, PhD, and also a master of philosophy in Asian studies at Sydney University. He is an expert on uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Indo Pacific uh, security affairs, with a lot of work he has done on Australian and Japanese foreign security policies. Um, conceptually, his research is uh, aimed at innovating our understanding of security architecture, in particular alliances, alignments, strategic partnerships. Um, and, and other forms of actually of security cooperation. Uh, he has vocal, focused a lot in his work on theorizing as well, middle powers and awkward powers. That's another term of related to uh, power definitions. Um, he's also very active in security policy debates. He's uh, serving at the moment as a non-resident senior fellow 
uh, for the Japan Institute for International Affairs. Uh, and he's also a regular contributor to the Sasakawa Peace Foundation's uh, International Information Network Analysis. He has research, received also various um, awards and honors. Uh, he was, for example, the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science long-term research fellowship he had. He had also the Taiwan Fellowship, Japan Foundation Japanese Studies Fellowship, and, and many others. Um, and we have the respondent, Professor Tangi Strey, welcome as well, who is a professor at the French-speaking Université Catholique de Rivain, expert in international relations, international security, US foreign policy, as well as middle powers, indeed, um, which is uh, important interest of converging between Thomas and uh, Professor Tangi Strey. So today's topic on alliance and alignments, of course, these are questions that scholars have been asking uh, and observe of puzzling about how do alliances emerge? Why states enter into alliances? Why do they persist? Why the alliances remain once the original initial security threat, for example, has disappeared with examples, of course, being uh, if we look at NATO or alliances in the Asia, in the Pacific, which the US hub and spoke security system still remains. Um, today, um, Professor Wilkins actually will engage a bit more with the conceptual, uh, theoretical, methodological aspects of alliances and alignments. Um, what is the study of alliances and alignments? So what are the main debates? How do we define them? You know, is there one definition? What are the com competitive or competing different definitions? How can we categorize them so that we understand better what alliances are? And then uh, what important methodological approaches uh, to alliances exist and what essentially um, uh, our contributing to our better understanding uh, of alliances and various forms of security cooperation. Uh, alignments, interestingly, of course, uh, not only obviously US friends and allies have been engaged in deeper security cooperation in the framework of alignment, but of course China has been one of the champions of uh, strategic partnerships which of course, are seen as one of the forms of alignment. Um, China has been very active in that. Okay, um, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Wilkins uh, for his presentation for about uh, 35 minutes, uh, if you could, to present your views. And then we will have the comments of Professor Stray. Also, it will be about 15 minutes response to uh, Thomas Wilkins' presentation. Okay, Thomas, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, um, Elena, for that kind introduction. So I'd like to thank um, Elena, Tom Sawyer, and uh, Yuichiro Sato for inviting me to participate in the Broken Umbrella project and giving me the opportunity to address you today on a subject dear to my heart. Um, thanks also to Tongi for um, agreeing to uh, respond to my presentation. And uh, finally, to, uh, to Barbara Sargent for uh, all of her um, logistical support, and of course, to members of the audience for attending. So <clears throat> alliances and other forms of alignment are still fundamental to the operation of the international system today, as they have been throughout history. The United States in particular um, heads up um, the most formidable military alliance ever known in the guise of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. And its hub and spokes network of bilateral security alliances spans the Asia Pacific region. Historically speaking, alliances, or in many cases, technically speaking, coalitions, have determined the outcome of system-wide wars and sealed the fate of nations and empires. They also provide vital military deterrence in times of peace. But we need to remember that while alliances are the most prominent and thus the most studied form of alignment between states, they're not the only manifestation of cooperative security, being joined at times by more informal ententes, temporary coalitions, and more recently, the ubiquitous strategic model, strategic partnership model of alignment that Elena just alluded to. Now, the majority of my presentation today will examine how we study alliances and international relations, but I'll complete my talk by giving an appraisal of the current state of alliances and alignments in the contested security environment, both as an arena for the application of scholarly knowledge and to spark further um, discussion in the Q&A. So the study of alliances and alignments. Given the prevalence and significance of alliances, how can we conceive of them and 
and that and what tools do we need to employ to study them within the international relations discipline those are really key questions um, for us as, uh, as um, scholars of alliances and alignments there are a number of different challenges to surmount before we can achieve a more systematic account of alliances as a phenomenon in IR. These include, firstly, more clearly defining and demarcating what we mean by an alliance as distinct from other associated forms of security alignment. Secondly, we need to contemplate how, differ how to differentiate empirical examples of alliance through their defining characteristics and work towards a cohesive and implementable set of typologies. Thirdly, we need to establish the best ways to understand or explain alliances theoretically, both in respect to their function as a component of the international system and their internal dynamics. Finally, we need to consider which are the most appropriate methodological approaches towards studying the alliance phenomenon in IR. Taken together, this would advance us closer to the ultimate goal of some form of grand theory of alliances that has not been achieved to date, since the literature is presently incomplete and fragmented rather than unified and whole. This being the case, it's worth taking stock of the tools we presently have in our arsenal for explaining and understanding alliances and other forms of alignment and contemplating their fitness for purpose, both from a conceptual or theoretical standpoint and whether they potentially whether these are potentially useful to policy uh, policymakers or, or um, military practitioners. Thus, we can evaluate the current state of disciplinary knowledge and identify shortcomings or pressing new avenues of research in light of a dynamic contemporary international environment. So now I'll address these four key areas that we need to contemplate in our appraisal of alliances or alignment study: definitions, typologies, theorizing and methodologies. So beginning with defining alliances as a concept. Any theoretical progress towards explaining or understanding alliances in IR will be hindered if we're not, un if we are unable to pr uh, precisely define our reference for study and achieve at least a modicum of consensus among the scholarly community. So where to begin? The Oxford English Dictionary, um, the, uh, the definition, the, the noun alliance in common parlance, um, infers some form of union or bond from which a number of more specific sub-definitions are derived, the most appropriate of which is the state or fact of being united for a common purpose, for mutual benefit, especially among nations or states. So it's obviously from this connotation that security specialists and alliance theorists naturally work from to develop a more precise disciplinary definition, or not, as the case may be since the term is still regrettably and promiscuously uh, used promiscuously and oftentimes inappropriately. Essentially, disciplinary disputes arise over whether a broad or a narrow definition of alliance should be applied. An example of a broad definition of alliances is the, the late Patricia Weitzman's bilateral or multilateral agreements to provide some element of security to the signatories. Now, this is a rather amorphous rendering, and one I would argue serves better to define security alignment as a synoptic phenomenon rather than alliance per se, as I'll discuss um, going forward. Alternatively, a narrow definition might be strengthened by employing the adjectival suffix military as a point of distinction. On this basis, a military alliance may be defined as follows, as per Glenn Snyder. Alliances are formal associations of states for the use or non-use of military force in specified circumstances against states outside their own membership. By detaching more amorphous notions of political alliance or economic alliance that sometimes come up, this narrow definition compresses the scope for what arrangements would qualify as reference for study, and by derivation, the theoretical and methodological approaches most appropriate. This is the one I prefer since it clearly ring fences genuine military alliances exhibiting mutual defense packs off from less formal, less committed forms of security cooperation, consigning the latter to where they belong as other non-alliance forms of security alignment. This brings us to another crucial distinction at this juncture regarding specifying our actual reference study that must be addressed before we can turn to theorizing the phenomenon. 
the relationship between alliance and alignment. These, are term, these terms are often conflated and employed in diverse ways, yet disambiguation is a necessary prerequisite before we can begin our investigations. There are two ways of looking at this conceptual relationship to my mind. The first is to segregate military alliances as per the narrow definition above from alignments with a lesser degree of commitment, such as strategic partnerships, entente, non-aggression pact or non-aggression pacts. In this view, alliances and alignments, i.e. non-alliances, serve as two distinct and separate phenomena. Alternatively, one can view alignment as a synoptic term, an umbrella term, inclusive of all forms of security cooperation across a spectrum, with military alliances being the most prominent and the most substantive. On the basis of Glenn Snyder's exhortations in his work Alliance Politics, there's strong grounds for adopting this second approach. Again, this has implications for theorizing of alliance alignment and, method and the methodological approach to be taken, as we'll discuss, discuss shortly. Bef but before that, we need to contend with how to categorize alliances through empirical typologies, a matter that our definitional practice has great bearing on. So looking at categorizing alliances through typologies, how, to how we classify or categorize alliances based upon these typologies is another important question. In other words, what kind of alliance are we analyzing in any given case study? Um, though all alliances will be unique to a degree, it's productive to attempt to classify them into categories based upon em em empirical criteria. Alliance data sets such as the correlates of war and alliance treaty obligations and provisions um, have sought to implement typologies and less structured discursive attempts have also appeared elsewhere in the literature. The original correlates of war data set coded alliances according to types, one to three, each displaying a different degree of formal obligation. These were one, the defense pact, two, uh, the non-aggression pact or neutrality pact, and three, uh, pledges to consultation. Here we immediately run into the issue of definitional integrity as per the, the discussion above. Whilst type one defense packs appear to capture the narrow definition of military alliance, non-aggression packs, non let alone pledges to consultation, do not. It, thus, in accord with the definition of military alliances that I gave earlier, non-aggression packs, neutrality packs, and consultation pledges must drop out of alliance specific study and be relegated to other alignments and treated as such. In addition to this fundamental objection, Apart from being limited in terms of depicting much about the actual essence of a given alliance, it's doubtful that um, the alliance, theorying, uh, alliance theorizing to be discussed next would necessarily apply to types two and three, and that different theories would be more appropriate. Now, the more recent correlates of war data set goes a little further down the path of actually characterizing alliance by providing an additional four cell matrix, labeling them as follows. A, extended deterrence alliances, B, imposed alliances, C, capability aggregating alliances, and D, single issue alliances. But this is not, this is, is not only problematic, but also hardly sufficient to capture the essence of various empirical alliances, historical or temp contemporary. Briefly, I would argue that all alliances are capability aggregating, a feature baked into the very purpose of alliance, according to the theories that I'll outline in a moment. And secondly, the categories seem a poor fit to the three um, previous typologies to which they're linked. For example, can we identify extended deterrence, non-aggression packs, or imposed pledges to consultation, for example? Perhaps, but it doesn't seem like a perfect fit. In light of this, we're still lacking a typology truly fit for purpose by which to classify alliances empirically based upon their characteristics. Thus, I would propose returning to the alliance literature, including older works such as um, George Liska and Hans Morgenthau, to address the issue of formulating a systematic set of subclassifications of the military alliance slash defense pact, types two and three naturally being excluded from this unless we're classifying alignments as a whole. With the limitations of sorting light military alliances as distinct from other forms of alignment in mind, 
we now need to tackle the issue of how to explain or understand um, uh, uh, these phenomena through IR theories. So let's turn now to theorizing alliances. It's always been part of the, uh, an aspiration on the part of theorists to attain some form of grand theory of alliances, along with the recognition that such, a, such an aspiration would be a formidable un undertaking and remain forever out of reach. In lieu of a grand, the uh, of a grand theory, um, we, what we have is a corpus of impressive alliance theorizing that deals with different aspects of alliance behaviors. And these are often applicable to other forms of alignment, although sometimes tangentially. Moreover, these are often located at different levels of analysis, for example, system, interstate, and domestic. If a holistic enterprise um, of grand theory were, um, were nominally possible, what would it need to look like? I would argue that, you'd, that it would need to primarily consider the following aspects, representing a life cycle of alliances through their formation, their maintenance, and their dissolution or persistence. We do also need to consider if alliances require different theoretical tools to explain them in peacetime versus wartime. All of these aspects and more have dedicated bodies of theoretical literature. So perhaps the challenge is simply working towards unifying them. But first we must sort them thematically and there's several ways we could do this. So we could tie them to the phases of the life cycle that I mentioned just now, or by de demarcating them according to um, referential levels of analysis. The pivotal neorealist structural explanation for alliance behavior at the system level of analysis is the venerable and much cited theory of international politics by the late Kenneth Waltz. As one of many theorists founding their assumptions on economic logic, Waltz posits that alliance formation and dissolution are functionally tied to the ba to balance of power capabilities between states. Balance of power has become the go-to explanation for alliance behavior and for compelling reasons. Stephen Walt's balance of threat variation began as a way of buttressing this neorealistic explanation of alliance formation and dissolution, but unwittingly departed from neorealist precepts by introducing perceptual, i.e. constructivist elements, which can only be located at the state level of analysis. He argues, of course, that threat perceptions rather than solely power capabilities per Waltz explain why states form alliances and why they should be expected to terminate once the threat is neutralized or eliminated through war. This certainly reinforced our alliance theorizing, but also revealed that purely structural explanations at the system level were insufficient in themselves. Taken together, these neorealistic neo, neo canons provide the closest we have to a, a macro theory of alliances. Continuing this reorientation of locus of analysis of alliance behavior, and shift in theoretical approach initiated in, through Walt's work, um, we arrive at the next most significant body of theorizing on intra-alliance politics. Primarily located at the interstate level, this literature not only substantiates state motivations for the formation or dissolution of alliances based upon policy preferences rather than structural imperatives. More than that, it sheds a lot of analytical light on the intervening phase of alliance maintenance between the, initial, uh, between the initial and terminal phases of formation and dissolution. Once formed, alliances must be deftly managed to maintain cohesion and effectiveness, a concern, that less abstract, ab a, concern, a concern less abstract than structural impulses of the international system, and thus of more interest to practitioners as well as scholars. Among the wide literature on intra-alliance politics, Glenn Snyder's contribution um, to revealing the intra-alliance security dilemma, i.e. abandonment versus entrapment, and George Lisker's earlier work on cohesion and efficacy are major contributions in fleshing out our understanding of internal rather than external alliance behavior. Lastly, there is more limited literature that addresses the question of alliance persistence as an alternative phase um, of the life cycle to dissolution. Neorealists assume that no alliance has an infinite duration and will eventually dissolve when the threat that brought it together expires. Experience shows, especially with NATO and the US alliances in the Asia Pacific, this has empirically not been the case. The works of Celeste Wallander and others have sought um, therefore to account for why institutionalization and socialization of alliance members and personnel contradicts the axial balance of power, balance of threat theories just mentioned. 
it thus operates at the interstate or perhaps the institutional level of analysis. At the specifically domestic level of analysis, scholarship has focused on how alliances affect and are affected by internal state dynamics. The works of Michael Barnett, and Jack Levy, and Tong Fee Kim, among many others, examine alliances at least partially from this perspective. These works show that the interact show the interaction between domestic and the, the domestic and interstate level, and how regimes or regime change can affect alliance dynamics. Naturally, these are not the limits of scholarship on alliances, but nicely illustrate the life cycle concept and illustrate how our theory, theorizing is spread across and overlaps between distinct levels of analysis. But now we reach a next issue, which is how to, how to, um, um, to approach uh, alliances methodologically in our study. So like the discipline of IR itself, Methodological approaches to alliance study can be bifurcated between quantitative and qualitative, qualitative handling of data, and both positivist and reflective, reflectivist theoretical dispositions. The quant approach is about the impressive formulation of empirical data sets, including alliance typologies and classifications that I mentioned previously. Um, these provide invaluable resources to alliance researchers in themselves and have been profit profitably exploited as the, as the basis for an affiliated literature, primarily in the service of testing hypotheses related to alliance dynamics. These include determining the effectiveness of alliance deterrence, propensity for war and allied reliability, and market theories, usually measured against data from the, 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 the correlates of war or ATOP um, data sets, and frequently linked to the theoretical alliance literature um, I've just discussed. These theories tend to reflect the greater emphasis on quant and positivist approaches witnessed in the Academy of North America and seek to scientifically explain alliance behavior in order to draw out concrete predictions. The accent here is proving uh, on proving recurrent patterns based upon a quantitative analysis of data sets. Now, on the qualitative side of the methodological lecture, uh, method, methodological ledger, um, is really about um, trying to achieve something rather different. The accent here is on understanding or interpreting empirical data, either to, con to construct or enhance theories, provide analytical frameworks, or supply guidance to policymakers in a digestible format. Though it might lack the parsim parsimony and elegance of some of the positivist approaches, it's able to offer a richer and more eclectically informed body of knowledge centering on historical and contemporary experience of the Alliance phenomenon. Since qualitative approaches often employ rationalist, i.e. realism and liberalism, and reflectivist, e.g. constructivism, critical theory, streams of IR theory, um, these studies are able to address the respective tension between the material and the ideational aspects inherent to alliances, sometimes neglected in other studies. To illustrate, Alliance theorists need to consider more than paper treaties to determine the credibility and effectiveness of a given alliance. Moreover, we also know that ideology can be an important driver in alignment, not purely military capabilities. From this, it's perhaps a shorter step to distill more edifying lessons and recommendations for policymakers and military practitioners who may well raise eyebrows at research founded upon regression analysis and the like as being too abstract to be a practical application. Also, it, involved, it avoids the bold claim of proving a theory in favor of the less risky formula of offering guidance. So to summarize the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the theoretical state of the, uh, state of the art or state of the discipline, how to be attentive to all the concerns raised above and how to knit these together to attain that elusive grand theory is the million, million dollar question for us. On this, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you that I don't have the perfect solution. Instead, I would offer that the first step is to comprehensively survey the theoretical, empirical, and methodological terrain to gain a holistic recognition of where we stand as alliance theorists at this point in time. Then we can work towards addressing gaps or insufficiencies in our knowledge through incremental progress towards this end goal. There's many obstacles to um, advancing this endeavor. Disaggregating alliances from other alignments is a key precursor, as I've argued. But perhaps most prominently, um, the incommensurate debates and con or conversations between different strands of IR theorizing 
for example, the rationalist versus the reflectivist schools and the bifurcation between quant and um, qual studies and pure theoretical approaches versus practical policy relevant approaches are some of the key obstacles. If more conversations could be initiated across these divides, perhaps synergies could be um, achieved and we could progress this formidably challenging, but yet greatly rewarding project further. So now that's what the, the theory looks like. And I, I promised that I would uh, relate this at least uh, briefly to um, the, the empirical terrain and the contemporary security environment. So now I want to sort of um, move to what um, this means for alliances or alignments today. So given what I've discussed from the conceptual and theoretical standpoint, um, where is it that we where, where is it that we that we stand um, in the main theaters of um, of the North Atlantic and the Indo Pacific? Well, you know some such as Rajan Menon have argued that the alliance model of alignment is becoming obsolete. Indeed, the last formal military alliance pact was in 1960 between uh, the People's Republic of China and North Korea. There'd been no new military alliances by the narrow cr criteria I enunciated above consecrated since that time. Yet the persistence and reformation of NATO and the US hub and spoke alliance network in the Asia Pacific indicates that we have not seen the end of alliances. Rather, a strategic competition intensifies both in Europe and the Indo-Pacific where these alliances obtain, their stock as an instrument of statecraft and power politics may be rising again after a post-Cold War, post -Cold War lull. There is no need to survey the strategic tensions in these regions as you're all familiar with them, but rather indicate what the prevailing alignment dynamics are as I see them. So I'll speak briefly about Europe, which is, um, which is not my specific area of expertise, though, of course, I have a certain degree of knowledge of what's going on there. So in the case of Europe, NATO still forms the mainstay of collective deterrence and defense against a resurgent Russia. NATO persisted despite the collapse of the common enemy threat in the form of the Warsaw Pact and Soviet Union, refuting the basic assumptions of the Waltzian and Waltian theoretical models. This is where alliance persistence explanations came in in the post-Cold War period. Combined with an identification by the alliance of potential new threats and a shift to out of area operations, such as Bosnia and Kosovo. The global war on terror, particularly in the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, reinvigorated NATO and shifted it towards new expeditionary, subsequently nation building and counterinsurgency missions. But the wheel now appears to have turned full circle, with both the US and especially the Central and East Asia. Eastern European countries now fearing a resurgent threat from the Russian Federation. However, whilst a conventional attack is still possible, Russia is engaged in asymmetrical conflict towards neighboring Ukraine and previously Estonia through the use of hybrid methods of warfare, thus changing the nature of the threat posed to the alliance. Furthermore, as commentators speak of a new Cold War, ideological battle lines are being redrawn between the democracies and the authoritarian states as represented by Russia and China. And this reminds us of the importance of studying the idea, ideational dimensions of alliance. Now, in the Indo-Pacific, which is my regional focus, I've argued in my book, The Dynamics of, the, the, uh, the Dynamics of Alignment, that we can apprehend three different concentrations of alignment into nascent blocks. One, the US Alliance Network, Two, China's uneven set of strategic partnerships, including through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and three, the ASEAN security community. But there's many other lesser and cross-cutting alignments across the region. Here, I'll simply provide my analysis of the, these alignments. But for those of you that are interested in the accompanying theory, um, you may also consult my book. So the first of these, the US hub and spoke network of bilateral alliances as metamorphosed in several ways. So first, Japan and Australia have increasingly formed a core within this system, triangulated through the trilateral strategic dialogue, um, which is arguably some kind of form of virtual alliance. Second, Thailand and arguably the Philippines have increasingly slipped out of Washington's orbit, while South Korea remains fixated on the North with little appetite for supporting a balancing strategy alongside the US versus China. Third, the US has sought not only to network 
its Asian allies by connecting the spokes together, but increasingly sought to forge new strategic partnerships with other regional countries, such as India, Singapore, Vietnam, plus it's enhanced its official, unofficial alignment with Taiwan. Fourth, attached to the US um, alliance network are a number of new minilateral, minilateral forms of alignment, such as the Quad, and of course, most recently, AUKUS, which are often erroneously dubbed align alliances, but don't meet the definitional criteria, definitional criteria I've posited um, in this talk. These new minilaterals have attracted significant attention and may well represent the future style of alignment to be practiced in the region. Meanwhile, other middle and small powers have been prolifically building strategic partnerships between themselves, an outstanding case being the Australia-Japan Special Strategic Partnership, on which I've written extensively. These partnerships vary in their degree of strategic commitment and capability, though some are stronger some of the more the, the stronger one, the, the, the stronger ones and more developed ones may well begin to approach nascent alliances themselves. So what about China's response to these um, developments? Well, Beijing has traditionally been hostile to US alliance policy in Asia, condemning it as a Cold War mindset. And any new initiatives such as the Quad or AUKUS as anti-China containment. Notably, it's eschewed military, formal military alliances itself as an instrument of policy. Nevertheless, Beijing has alternatively forged a series of strategic partnerships, some more rhetorical than real, um, indicating that it practices a non-alliance format of alliance policy. The most central of these is the Sino-Russian Strategic Partnership, created in 1996 and since having been so expanded and deepened that it is increasingly considered to be a de facto alliance or on the or on the verge of an alliance in Alex Korolev's words. The bilateral partnership is also the linchpin of the hybrid style Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This is a very peculiar quasi alignment quasi multilateral configuration. Um, and we can certainly talk about that, uh, you know, how we might understand that in the Q&A. Remarkably, though, um, Beijing and Pyongyang recently renewed their 1960 um, treaty alliance, um, which might suggest a shift in alignment policy and a more of an emphasis on alignments um, among policymakers and strategists in Beijing. I mean, perhaps Beijing and even perhaps New Delhi as well, which is also famous for its non-alignment, are beginning to rethink their aversion to formal military alliances as, re as regional strategic competition and animosity increases. After all, it's good to have committed friends as allies rather than just partners. And lastly, to complete the regional picture, what about ASEAN? Uh, what about uh, ASEAN and, their, and, and its component states? Well, ASEAN should certainly never be misconstrued as an alliance, to be sure. It's both officially advertised as a security community and theorized as such by scholars. It is, I would argue, however, another form of non-alliance non alignment since it engages in notable security cooperation among members towards a common purpose. The suite of pan-regional multilateral security architecture, ASEAN Regional Forum, ASEAN Plus Three, East Asia Summit, should on no account be considered as an alignment since these dialogue forums include a range of antagonistic parties. Yet increasingly, since ASEAN lacks a mutual collective defense treaty, various member states have looked for more robust security guarantees, even military support from external powers, notably Singapore's um, strategic partnership with the United States and the five power um, defense arrangement, FPDA, with Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, um, and the UK. So um, I'll wrap things up, uh, up here after that, that uh, brief overview of the empirical terrain and just sort of um, uh, end by saying, I think it's possible to discern a tightening of regional alignments as geopolitical rivalry hardens in tandem with this military technological competition that we're seeing, especially in the Indo-Pacific. But different parties will employ different forms of security alignment. The US seeks to recalibrate its alliance networks placing higher priority on its most willing and able allies, while supplementing these with additional bilateral strategic partnerships and new mini-lateral formations. 
China appears increasingly concerned about the counter-alignments it's provoking and perhaps rethinking, as some of the Chinese literature attests, um, the need for more dependable, uh, uh, dependable partners, if not allies, with Russia and North Korea presently the co closest of these. As for ASEAN, its members are caught in the crossfire of an emerging bipolar division, and individual countries seek outside protection, mainly from the United States, in the event that neutrality becomes an untenable option as, Sino -American, as the Sino-American strategic contest unfolds. So I'll finish there and I'll um, thank you all for your kind attention and uh, now look, very much look forward to uh, Tongi's inter intervention before we move to Q&A. Thank you, Elena. Thank you so much, Thomas. Fantastic presentation. Exactly 30 minutes. Wonderful. And thank you so much for really engaging uh, with the conceptual, theoretical um, aspects, methodological aspects of alliances. I think also the empirical part was fascinating, especially for our audience who are a mixed audience, some from the Asia Pacific, some from Europe. But the Indo Pacific does remain quite interesting empirically as a test case of your conceptualizations of alliance and alignments. Uh, obviously, as China, as I referred to at the beginning, and then you at the end of your presentation also referred to China and I'm sure that uh, that our audience will probably be interested a little bit more on, on, on China's approaches to alignments, the Sino-Russian alignment. Uh, actually, by the way, here in Brussels, very often we hear the Sino-Russian alliance. You see in the rhetoric of officials, they refer to it an alliance. But listening to you, obviously, we, we understand actually now the differences between the two and, and the aspects of a non-alliance format of an alignment, non-alliance format of alignment, which obviously is much more applicable if we unpack and understand, you know, the, the different approaches. And obviously also the costs that alliances incur, because these are not cheap kind of forms of cooperation in, 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 in comparison with alignments like the Chinese have with, with so many, I think more than 67 or 70 partnerships, organizations. And China also interesting categorizes them. You have the comprehensive strategic, strategic and others, you know, some sort of gradation uh, on in that hierarchical structure that China has. Okay, I would like to give uh, the floor to Professor Tangi Stray. So Tangi, please, uh, for your comments on uh, Thomas' presentation. Thank you, Elena. Um, first of all, thank you, Tom, for your presentation. Um, and in general, well, I agree with you about 80% what you said. So my remarks will be very limited on uh, some issues. Um, I like, first of all, I, I like the way you divided the theoretical part, because I think it's uh, an, an general approach, macro approach, where you actually uh, discuss I think theoretically and conceptually, everything we should need to study when we study uh, alliances. Um, so the, the fact that we have the definition, the apologies, uh, the terrorism uh, with the quantitative, quanti uh, qualitative approaches, and th uh, the theories, and then the methodology. Um, concerning um, all the uh, divisions concerning the theoretical approach, I will come back on every Every one, uh, on every, every each of one, um, every uh, sorry, every part uh, of your presentation. Um, concerning first the definition, I think it's the way you handled it is actually the way I would have done it because why I am I am saying that is that today when we we'll read about alliances, it has become everything. Uh, and you mentioned it. I mean, um, it's uh, more than uh, coalitions today are considered as alliances. Uh, Elena was talking about the China-Russia, uh, I say partnership, because for me it's not an alliance, because it doesn't uh, correspond to the definition that you use, but that's actually, uh, I will come back on that, is for me the definition that we should use when we talk about alliances. And when it doesn't fit this definition, it's not an alliance. So we should stop talking about concepts that are not alliance. Why is that? Because when we see China and Russia as an alliance, it means that you, as a policy decision maker, or even as a theorist, you're limiting already the answers because that means, okay, there is an alliance. Well, no, there is no alliances. And neither Russia, neither China are saying that there is an alliance. So that is, I think, very important. That's also why I really liked your definition of narrow definition, mainly also based on the military uh, element. Um, and there is 
some trends today to invent things. Um, one hand, people do, do want to be published, so they invent new concepts. Uh, and in this case of Alliance, we see many of them where you know, they change their definitions and so on. And what I, all, what I also saw uh, in different publications is that no alliances are defined without having a treaty and just actually being partnerships. So this brings really uh, chaos in the theoretical approaches when actually there are the good definitions that exist uh, and certainly concerning alliances. It's not the case, for example, for middle powers, because middle powers, I have been writing a lot, as you know, middle powers still don't know what it is, how it works. But alliances, I mean, uh, we have some definitions who are exactly defining what we should expect from uh, alliances. And the way you mention it is, I think, very uh, well done. So I don't have any, I would say, go ahead with this approach uh, and don't change anything about about it because otherwise it's going to become again a mess on the definitions and I do think that coalitions is not the same as alliances alignment is not the same um, a few years ago it was um, ad hoc coalitions or coalition a la carte uh, it was very criticized by uh, when Bush did it 15 years ago but everyone is doing it today so it's an also an interesting view that things change uh, depending on who says things. Um, so concerning the definition, I completely, completely agree with you um, on that. The second part concerning typologies, I do have more question on this part. Um, because the definition of um, alliances is so narrowed, I'm wondering what how, or how you would see typologies. I do see a typologies between uh, alignment and alliances, and then you have coalitions, partnerships, and so on and so on. But concerning the alliances as such, would you develop a typology or was it more the idea of to develop a typology going from alignment to alliance, who is the strongest cooperation, if you want, and then between you have others, because I don't see how you would have a typology concerning the alliances based on your definition. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. So maybe that uh, you could explain how you see things uh, concerning the, uh, the typologies and how you would develop them uh, if uh, you would like to do that. Concerning the theories, um, First of all, well, I agree with the fact that uh, for me, it's a very important. Uh, I always work with different uh, theories. So I'm not someone who like to have only one theory. Um, so the fact that you mentioned, first of all, of course, the neorealist approach is clearly one of the basics ones. But I think I do, do think that they have to be complemented, as you mentioned, by the one, and clearly it's the most famous one of Stephen Walt, where you have this balance of threat that is explaining, as you mentioned already in your paper, the whole perceptual constructivist approach. Um, I think it's very important. Um, and then I have two remarks concerning the theoretical approach. Uh, I do think that uh, you should put more uh, emphasis uh, on the institutional approach. Because what we see with NATO uh, or bilateral alliances, and I will come back in, the, in your case today on that, is that uh, institutionalism has become very important in alliances. If you look at NATO, it's clearly after the Cold War, everyone was wondering, okay, what is the purpose of NATO? And actually it's because of NATO has become so institutionalized that, we we, that NATO changed their mission, their objectives, and now are going to again change their mission based on the new threats coming from China and Russia. And that we see, and we see that also on the EU level, is that once people are starting to work for institutions, they think institutions. Uh, it's very interesting. I had, I had that uh, this uh, comments concerning the, well, of course, no, it, we have Brexit, but when the uh, Brits were still in the EU, uh, it seems that there, are, there were many skeptics who were coming, were coming to Brussels and they had to work for the EU. And after a few years, they became actually very pro-EU because they saw how it worked and they, they were in the idea of institutionalization. And I think it's very important when we talk about alliances that we talk about that because uh, it creates what we call the whole issue of we feeling uh, and of, also of socialization. 
And this, these are maybe the parts that I missed in your theoretical approach, is that we, we shouldn't underestimate the fact that people are working together and that they, they create a real NATO identity or Australian US identity because they work together. Um, and that makes clearly alliances stronger. Even when there are divisions on the state level, it's very interesting to see where are they still working together is NATO. When there are uh, tensions between the US and the EU, NATO says, hey, hey we are working further. Uh, and it was the same thing with AUKUS. Uh, there was these tensions with the French and NATO was saying, yeah, but in NATO, we don't care about that. We are still working on issues concerning Ukraine, concerning the other things. So I think we, you should put more emphasis theoretically on the approach of socialization um, uh, and centralization, which linked also to norms, standards, and things like that. Because that, for me, it's, it makes uh, alliances stronger. And when we come back on the China-Russia, uh, that is something I miss in the China-Russia. There is no we feeling. These two states have common interests, are working together, because they have an, a, a common objective, meaning destroying the US. I'm not saying militarily, but clearly weakening the US. And that brings them together. But there is no clearly no common identity between the Chinese and the Russian. I'm not saying that it could not become a reality in 20 years or 15 years, but it's clearly not the case today. And it's clearly the case with NATO because there are, they share the same values, uh, norms, and things like that. And, and here again, of course, things could change, but I think it's very important. And the whole issue of Gemeinschaft that was developed by Bazin, uh, by Bazin I think could also help uh, when we study uh, alliances. So I think the, uh, the, of course, it's linked to constructivist approaches, but I think you, maybe you could put more emphasis on this uh, element. Um, and then concerning methodology, I completely agree with you also. The, so the, for the theoretical approach, I think we have to have a mix of quantitative, quantitative approaches and qualitative, uh, qualitative approaches. Um, uh, we were talking before the presentation about that. Uh, there is a tendency to have to put too much emphasis on the quantitative approaches and neglecting everything that is linked to the qualitative, uh, qualitative approaches, meaning leadership, meaning we, between, uh, the interoperability and things like that. It's not only about alliances are not only about uh, capacities. And it's actually the fact that I was talking about socialization and institutionalization is exactly the fact that quantitative approaches will not give, if you only study alliances based on quantitative approaches, it will not give the good answers to what is an alliance and how it works. Um, and that brings me to the uh, case study, um, where I do have also some remarks. But well, first of all, um, I completely agree with you what, in what you said about the case study, so NATO and the hub and spoke network. Um, and the fact that we see for, for, for NATO, well, I don't, I don't think we need to discuss more because uh, what you said was, I think, right. Um, and I think that NATO will survive. Uh, we will see that, of course, in June with the new strategic concept. But clearly, the, 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 the importance of NATO is so important, actually, that I don't see um, NATO disappear. What we will probably see, and I think it's a good thing, is that the EU pillar or the European pillar will be stronger uh, in NATO and potentially also more autonomous if we take the strategy autonomy that uh, EU is defending. Concerning the hub and spoke, um, I also agreed with you. I agree on, uh, also on the fact that the, the strength of the hub and spoke is still Japan, Australia, US. I mean, clearly they have been reinforcing their work bilaterally and trilaterally. So that's clearly, uh, for me, the strongest alliance, if you want, in the, in the region. Um, I agree with you on Thailand, uh, maybe less on the Philippines. Uh, the reason is that it's interesting to see that although we had Duterte, I, ha I don't have the impression that on the ground, the alliance has, has weakened because all the treaties are still there. Um, they have still this possibility to rotate their forces. And Duterte will be gone in a few months. 
uh, I don't know when, when there are the elections, but it's, I think it's in, in a few months. So I think the, the, the alliance have actually, has actually well survived the, the Trump Duterte, because it was also a Trump uh, uh, administration. So I would be less pessimistic with the Philippines, also because the Philippines have now the last few weeks had so many had many problems with the Chinese uh, concerning the, the South China Sea. Um, but that doesn't mean that clearly there are no problems. Concerning South Korea, it's always interesting to hear about South Korea because we never know exactly where they stand. Uh, yes, they stand with the US, but they are more ambiguous. And of course, you have the South Korea Japan pro uh, issue that is clearly weakening the hub and spoke uh, policy. Um, and the fact is that the Americans have tried to bring US, uh, uh, Japan, and South Korea together, but it doesn't work. So clearly, that, it, that is the weak point of the uh, relation. And then finally, I have just uh, some uh, final remarks concerning alliances, uh, but on the, based on your case studies. Are there going to be new alliances in the region? I don't think so. And I, here I mean alliances in the way you defined uh, alliances uh, at the beginning. I'm not talking about partnerships. I mean, we see many, many new partnerships, bilateral, trilateral. I mean, the French are trying to do that. We have AUKUS. Um, we have the Brits who are more and more present, the Germans, the Dutch, because they have, all of them have developed their Indo-Pacific strategies. So we see more and more partnerships. Well, what is interesting is that we talk about these partnerships since at least 10, 15 years. So, they are, so if you take, for example, Australia, Vietnam, or Indonesia, they're working together, some military exercises, but I haven't seen a lot of developments the last few years that would say, okay, they're going to be an alliance. You know, okay, there's cooperation, but the cooperation is still actually very limited uh, for all these bilateral, trilateral uh, approaches. Once again, Japan and Australia is clearly an exception. Um, what I also see is that um, we see, um, or everyone is talking about the famous Quad, but Quad is not an alliance. It's a sort of partnership. We don't really know what it is at this moment, but it's clearly not an alliance because India is not at this moment uh, in the logic of alliances uh, and is still in a logic of non-alignment, although on the ground things are changing, but clearly Quad is not an alliance today, maybe a partnership. And I don't think it will be tomorrow, but uh, it's clearly a reinforcing. So if we take Quad in 2007, we look at Quad 2001, uh, 2021, there are clearly very interesting evolutions, but I don't think it will evolve in, a, in an alliance, also because India is the neighbor of, of China, and that could bring tensions in the North, uh, and I'm not sure that China, uh, India wants that. So concerning the Quad, um, I'm less optimistic for an alliance. And then uh, that's something what I wrote a lot about in 2016, 2017. I think the middle powers missed the opportunity, opportunity in the years 2015, 2018, or even 2020 to form a third block. And what I call, you know, middle power alliances, but clearly what is missing is a we feeling. I mean, all these middle powers do have some common ground but if you look at the relationships, you will never have a third block. Uh, you will never have a middle power alliances. And the main reason is that I don't see Japan and South Korea uh, having an alliance. I don't see today Australia and Indonesia. There are more and more tensions between the two. And if you look at the demography of Indonesia and the economical potential, Australia will have a lot of problems with Indonesia in the, next, uh, in the future. So middle powers, uh, I don't think middle powers will form a third block. And, and that brings me to the, what you said is that they will have to choose. So they will have to choose between China and the US in the next five, 10 years. If the, the competition between the two becomes stronger and stronger, they will have to choose. And there will be less and less what I, I wrote with, uh, well, you know her, Dorothy, a few years ago about the swing states. So I think there are going to be less and less swing states um, in the next few years. 
And then finally, my uh, last remark is, um, uh, I just have two last remarks. Um, I think it's Elena who was talking or even you about the costs of, um, of alliances. But still now, I think that the cost is less important than the benefits. Uh, for NATO, uh, if we look at NATO, for the US, is it NATO, is it um, uh, Japan, Australia? Also because US is in decline, so they need allies. Something Trump didn't understand, but he didn't understand a lot. So clearly um, risk sharing, burden sharing, um, and even um, uh, the, the whole issue of burden shifting uh, has become very important. And I think that if the US wants to guarantee the liberal order, they need allies. Um, so it's very benefic for the US to have all these allies in the world, because without them, they will, would clearly not be the leader anymore. So um, because China, US, if you look at the quantitative, uh, if you compare them quantitatively, you see that the gap is narrowing very fast between US and China. And the only reason why US is still number one is because they have so many allies that if you compare the two China and US plus allies, I mean, there is no discussions where the capacities are. Uh, the only allies the Chinese have is North Korea, but it's, I don't think it's a very helpful ally. So clearly the, the issue of cost for me is in this case, benefic, uh, beneficial for the US. And then the final remark, I do think that we should not uh, underestimate the importance in allies and alliances uh, of the decision maker. Uh, and here I'm going back a little bit on the theory because clearly um, the way Trump handled the alliances was very problematic and weakened the US, but also NATO and different allies uh, in the region, because he saw allies as a patron uh, client relation, uh, what you never should do when you talk about alliances, because it's all about prestige, reputation, uh, involvement of your allies, even if they are weaker, you have to bring them in and clearly not be in a logic of coercion. Uh, and we saw the results, it doesn't really work, although you could always discuss that uh, thanks to coercion, uh, NATO is now engaged, um, financially is, is putting more money uh, in NATO, but uh, it already started under the Obama administration also, when there were uh, different pressures uh, concerning the, uh, the famous 2%. So um, I will be maybe finishing with what Winston Churchill said about alliances. The only thing harder than fighting with allies is fighting without them. And I think he was right. And uh, that's uh, why I think alliances are so important because without them, you're, you're clearly weaker. And I will stop there. Okay, thanks a lot, Tangi. You were, uh, I must say, like an uh, excellent teacher who has unpacked a student's paper and looked at all different aspects. Uh, Thomas, I think you have a, a lot to think about. Fantastic remarks about Tangi and I, uh, Tangi's remarks. And I just wanted to mention on uh, indeed many things, uh, so, so many interesting elements, in particular the, the references to the we feeling indeed in the alliances as opposed to various other partnerships. And it's interesting to think that indeed China, Russia, as I mentioned earlier, decision makers in Brussels do often refer to alliance. Obviously, it does not uh, go along with the concepts that we have been discussing. It's interesting to think why that word of alliance is so kind of, uh, you know, for decision makers so useful when they make certain references, because perhaps presenting China Russia as an alliance presents a larger threat than if you would define them in a different way. Okay, uh, we already have actually questions from the audience. So Thomas, if you can very, very briefly respond to some of the remarks of Tangi so that we can engage also with the audience a little bit. Thank you. Yep, understood. Thanks, Elena. Um, well, it's very nice to hear from you, uh, Tongi. Obviously, we've done some great work together on uh, middle powers and uh, more recently awkward powers. And so I know that you know we're, we've got a lot of common ground. So um, you know that's that was you know a, an absolutely terrific um, interrogation of the paper. Um, yeah, I just wish we had like five hours for me, for me to, uh, to 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 address all these points. But uh, I'll just pick out a few for sort of 
seven minutes for something and then um and then we'll move on to the q a so um yeah i mean basically what i, what I did there and it kind of became clear to me um yeah in the way that you described it and elena said you know this is uh, you know the, is sort of dissecting this is uh, you know trying to give a kind of a, a toolkit for studying uh studying alliances so that's kind of a good way of, of thinking what i was trying to achieve with this um with this speech um about the about the definitions yeah i mean i think you know if the definitions are not used more carefully and of course we can't you know we can't change the utterances of un uninformed policymakers i mean we could probably expect a bit more from security analysts or scholars you know our expectations are higher we can't stop them from using the term alliance to describe like literally everything but at least you know some of us need to be fighting that fight to try and get more specificity and more precision to the definition and that, and of course that's critical with the scholarship otherwise you you can't you know you can't distinguish what the referent of study is and so you know how can you build any good theories or anything um, I want to throw a spanner in the works for myself, actually, on the definitions, which is, well, you know, I said we need to we need to kind of you know disaggregate the the non-treaty alliances and just focus on the defense packs as being the, the true or the genuine alliances. Now, you know, there's you know nothing in the social sciences or, or social phenomena are ever straightforward. And there's one little glitch with that because you know, I think there are could be cases of countries that are sort of like in de facto, if not de jure alliances, um, where they don't put that treaty in there. And you, you alluded to this about the, about, uh, in the case studies, you know, I don't think we'll see any of these treaty alliances. And I think you're right because, you know, maybe these, you know, signing, you know, would have been signing the documents now, maybe it's emailing the documents today, but, you know, signing that, you know, that parchment, that treaty, you know, paper and putting your, you know, seal on it and everything. Um, maybe those are the old ways of, you know, of alignment or alliance. Um, and so, you know, treaties can be very, very provocative. Just imagine if, you know, if uh, AUKUS or any of the other arrangements we mentioned, the Quad or something, issued a treaty, an alliance treaty, mutual defense treaty, um, what the response would be from China and Russia and so forth. So, I mean, I think there's a sense of that. And so there may be this kind of tendency that things could be more alliancy than we think in some of these, the, these what appear to be looser alignments. The example I'll give is AUKUS. I mean, the more I think about it, like this is seriously, you know, looks like an alliance even though it doesn't have this treaty here it will it, it, it you know doesn't have the you know the documentation but it will act like an alliance i mean there's there's virtually no daylight between these three countries and you know people have really got thrown off by this uh, submarine deal and everything but the submarine deal and all of the other stuff that's built around it especially the trust the we feeling between these anglosphere countries australia the us and the uh, and the united states just basically means it adds up to an alliance i mean and again when you in, in integrate those those um nuclear powered submarines or what you know all of the other things that i've talked about together with the US and the, and the UK. I mean, this, you know, th this really looks like a, a sort of like the, maybe a nascent Asian NATO, if there is such a thing, but it's a, it's, a, it's an Asian NATO for the 21st century, not, you know, a just modeling it exactly on, you know, the, the NATO of um, 1949, right? So, um, so you know, those are things to um, to, to think about. Um, in terms of the typologies, yeah, just to clarify, I mean, boy, this is you know, this is a huge um, challenge. So, I think there's a couple of things we can do, right? First is, and you, you sort of alluded to the answers yourselves, which is, I think we need to see like alignment as this you know umbrella term right and then there's a spectrum of alignment from just pledge to consultation which is effectively nothing because you don't have to consult and if you do you could just say well okay that's nice see you right and um you know all the way building up you know to, with more intensity and more connections towards you know the military treaty alliance so you know nato and and so forth would be on the the, the top end of the or, or the, the far end of the spectrum the, the strongest one so that's your spectrum of alignment but then, so you, you know, within that spectrum, you'd have like, you know, pledges to consultation, entente, coalitions, strategic partnerships, all weaker than, than the strongest one, alliance. But then also, let's just take alliance itself, and we need subcategories of alliance as well. So, you know, to characterize these. So, you know, um, you know, some of the things I've sort of suggested in, in other papers are sort of, you know, um, open versus closed alliances, um, you know, sort of uh, asymmetric versus symmetric alliances. Like we just need to get drilled down a bit more into the characteristics of alliances. We can't just say all defense packs are the same, right? Of course they're not, right? We need to, you know, we, we need, we need to, to paint a portrait of, of different 
some apologies or, or characterizations of alliance. Um, let me just tackle maybe just one or two more um, things um, quickly. Um, yeah, about the Philippines, you know, I said arguably, and I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. It's, it's difficult to know, you know, it depends on the day of the week as to how you might assess it. And so, you know, I had a bit of a look at that, a look at it recently. And, um, you know, there's um, this idea, you know, that, um, the, that um, the Philippines has kind of flip-flopped a little bit and it's thrown a lot of spanners in the works over like actual military cooperation with the United States, but you know, the treaty instrument remains. And then the other thing, you know, you, you, you stress the emphasis on, on institution, institutionalization, and that is absolutely there amongst the Filipinos. Like, I mean, you know, I've interacted with a lot of these people um, and, uh, you know, the sense that, you know, that, that this we feeling between the military establishment and some of the political elite between um, the, the Philippines and the United States is incredibly strong and, you know, and should give it momentum beyond the, you know, the, the chaos of the, you know, the Trumpian antics of Duterte. But, but on the military side, they're sort of like, okay, one minute you can come, next minute you're not, we're going to cancel, no, we're not going to cancel, that sort of thing. Um, which just, you know, so I'll just end you know, on the point of the institutionalization. I think it's a strength and a weakness. Um, so it can be a weakness in terms of, um, you know, uh, sort of fixed mindsets and, you know, people will become socialized within to this and then they, you know, maybe lose sight of the national interest because they're identified with the alliance or like you said, with the EU or something. But it's also a strength, of course, because it builds capacity, right? And it builds interaction. And it is the basis for that, that you know, that identification and that we feeling, consultation, you know, um, all of the sort of interoperability and everything. So I think it's a double-edged sword, the in institutionalization. And I will just leave it there because um, we, um, you it would be great to have some some time for q a um but there's so many points there and i just wish we had so much more time to to unpack them all and, and bounce them around between us okay thank you thomas and again thanks tangi for the extensive comprehensive uh, um comments and we have three questions from the audience uh, and i would like uh, to tackle them one by one uh so the first one in how far is the goal of balance of powers a euphemism for maintaining imperial power by the most powerful member of the alliance. I think Thomas, you may be able to see them in the in the Q and A. Uh, uh, no. Right. Um, so uh, the chat or the Q and A. The Q and A. The Q and A. Oh, if you okay. click on. Ah, oh, right. Okay. okay. Just, and we're just looking at the first here. question. So, in how far is the goal of balance of powers a euphemism for maintaining imperial yeah. power by the most powerful member of the alliance? Yeah, um, yeah, that's that's that, that's a good question. I mean, of course, alliances have um, internal dynamics, and you know they have you know the different different you know that's how I say we need the, we need the characteristics. So you know, in in this case, there's kind of an internal balance of power. We, if we take the example, say of the Philippines and the United States, U.S. Philippines, right? I mean, clearly the United States is orders of magnitude more powerful, and so you know. I mean, if you wanted to use perhaps a, 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 you know, a less charitable term, you might even say, you know, the Philippines is a client state of the United States. And that's even been said about Japan as well. I mean, and it could be said about Australia. I mean, um, so, so this is, you know, so, so it has two things. I mean, one, it means that, that the United States calls the shots. And so we have this kind of, and, and Tongi alluded to this, this kind of nominal equality between members, because, you know, this is a diplomatic nicety, you know, or, you know, just like the United Nations, you know, everyone is nominally equal, but, you know, some are obviously considerably more equal than others. So, you, so you've got that dynamic, but also, you know, just to sort of spin the, so, so there is an internal balance of power and that can shift as well. I mean, you think of something like the, you know, um, it wasn't technically speaking an alliance, although sometimes the Grand Alliance was used to describe um, you know, World War II and uh, the US, uh, the UK and, uh, and the Soviet Union. And you know, that alliance, the balance of power within that alliance, and therefore the amount of bargaining power and the amount you know, that each ally could advance its own national interests within the alliance, it shifted. So I mean, at the beginning, Britain had more troops deployed than the United States and was engaged in, in many theatres. But once the, um, the, the United States had kind of mobilised its full power, Britain's voice began to shrink within that grand alliance. And it was no longer the big three, but the big two and a half. So you see that internal balance of power dynamic. That's part of the inter-alliance politics literature. Um, but then the other thing is to spin the question a little bit and say, well, you know, Alliances themselves can be hegemonic when you have such a power imbalance. Like, you know, it's a way of the United States in, in some ways shaping, if not controlling, the security policy of, you know, of, of smaller allies. 
um, and, you know, and sort of gaining various assets like location. I mean, originally, of course, the United States had very, very important military bases, Subic and Clark in, in the Philippines, you know, and, and expanding its own power um, whilst in return, you know, offering this, the, the, the guarantee to the, you know, to, to the junior partner. So there's always kind of senior and junior partners. And so it's interesting to look at, you know, AUKUS, if it is some sort of form of virtual alliance, you know, you've got US superpower, you've got Britain great power, and then you've got Australia middle. Well, you know, obviously the amount of say you have in the alliance, the amount of symmetry or asymmetry in the alliance is going to be dictated by those, those different um, respective um, uh, power kind of hierarchies. So yeah, that's, that's an important question to look at. Okay, many thanks. Uh, next question we have, what do you think are the most important sources of uncertainty for alignment and alliances of the world in the coming years. Uh, the speaker points out that for him, that would be the 2024 US presidential election. So what is your take on then the sources of uncertainty for alliances and alignments? Mm. In yeah, so what are sort of the implications going? I mean, this, this kind of slightly engages what Tongi was saying about you know, the importance of the decision maker, especially when that decision maker is the president of the United States and the kind of, you know, the perspective they, the, 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 the they have on alliances. Now, of course, with Biden, we've heard this sort of, you know, this is business as usual. We're going to value our alliances and everything just because, you know, we're, you know, we're back to being the nice guys. But also I think is, you know, again, and, and Tongi alluded to this, the United States, like you know, its alliances were were very useful in the in the Cold War, and you know, and, and still useful in the post Cold War period. But now those alliances are crucial to the United States, given its relative um, decline in power. Um, you know, as an individual state, I mean, the gap has closed between China and the United States. That the capabilities that those alliances can bring to the table for the United States is is a large margin of its kind of power or strategic advantage. So I think we'll see the United States value its alliances more. I mean, I attended a, um, you know, genuinely for material reasons, as well as, you know, diplomatic and sort of, you know, ideological reasons. Um, not to say actually that the, the ideological fa factor, I think, is also is also rising in alliances. We tend to sort of say, oh, it's just about balance of power. But now this kind of division of the world between, you know, the, the, the Western democracies, you know, Western in the loosest sense, because it includes Japan and so forth, um, you know, and, and Australia and, and everything, um, the Western democracies and, you know, the authoritarian compact between um, Moscow and Beijing, I think ideology has, has much more come to the forefront. And maybe, you know, sort of this, you know, a lot of the, the discourse that surrounds um, the formation or the perpetuation of alliances is often pitched in ideological terms that covers up the kind of the naked realpolitik of, of power aggregation. But I just think that, you know, for material as well as ideological reason, reasons, the United States will, will, will probably be more, well, you know, will, will be more sort of respectful to allies. But I also think it's going to be more generous as well in terms of um, sort of the support that are material support that is forthcoming for allies. Now, we can see some indicators of this. So, I mean, you know, firstly, obviously, Taiwan is not a, an official ally, but it's a, you know, un, unofficial or, you know, a, a, um, or aligned in some form. And so the United States is, you know, ramping up its, its um, material assistance, military assistance to Taipei. Um, but also, I mean, I haven't confirmed this yet, but I, I, I was just reading some, some accounts, you know, not all news sources are entirely accurate. So I want some triangulation from, from you know, from, from other sources. Sources, but I did just pick up on one commentary this morning um, about discussions that the United States was going to start moving F-22 Raptors, B-2 bombers, and so forth to Australia, which means, whoa, this is amazing for Australia, right? It's massively profiting now um, from, you know, from its, its bilateral agreement. Then you put that together with AUKUS and everything. Um, this is just a turbo charge to Australia's security. Also makes Australia a target as well. Um, but, it, you know, it, it means um, that the US is... You know, it is is a more is a more generous move than it was in the past. Like, oh, Japan, you can't have the F-22s, right? They're not giving F-22s to Australia, but if they station them here, that's the next best thing. So, um, you know, so I think maybe um, you know those are some important developments to watch. But no one can predict exactly what's going to happen in the you know in the um, you know in the, in the election cycle. Um, and you know, it, you know, probably the most important thing is that the United States has a has, has a you know a strong and determined leader. And uh, well, you know, I'll say. 
take my personal assessments of Biden, but I don't think he's the right man for the right time at the moment. He's more of a stopgap and just sort of allowing drift. But people like Kirk Campbell and everything are absolutely, you know, working away on reinforcing and valuing their allies and, and trying to do more with their allies. So, so that's a, a positive sign going forward. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, next question. Um, I do not know whether you have empirically engaged with that. The question is about, is the African Union an alliance, an alignment, or a combination of both? Hmm. Um, so uh, I certainly haven't done anything on, anything on it recently. Uh, well, when I was writing this um, article, Alignment, Not Alliance, um, I had a look at it um, a, a little bit. Um, but uh, my, my sense is um, it's probably, probably neither. It's probably more um, something like, uh, um, well, I don't know exactly what sort of how, how you would characterize it e exactly, but uh, more of a uh, sort of pan-regional dialogue forum. So, you know, maybe sort of, you know, institutional architecture or possibly security architecture. And this is, you know, a forum within which, you know, um, various states can kind of, you know, cooperate, share views and everything. I mean, it might lead to things like a sort of peacekeeping operations and everything, but I, I wouldn't want to sort of weigh in on the on the granularity of that because it's not, um, unfortunately, um, you know, at the, at the center of my center of my focus. Um, it's as far as I know, it's definitely not an alliance, but there could be some elements of alignment within it. Um, but but I wouldn't say I'd like to say too much because it's not my area of expertise. But it's definitely worth having a look at, especially to juxtapose, you know. I mean, we talk about, you know, non-Western here, but, you know, most of the world is, is Westernized. They use the same practices as the West, even if they're Asian countries or, or Latin American countries. Um, but, you know, to look at different regions that aren't, you know, these core regions. So, I, you know, I looked at Europe um, or the North Atlantic and I looked at the Indo-Pacific because those are the, like the, the key sort of, you know, global strategic powerhouses in the world. But, you know, it would be very productive to juxtapose this to what's happening on the African continent, what's happening in Latin America, you know, what's happening in the Middle East and everything, um, so that we could sort of, you know, gather some, you know, some useful um, data about, you know, non, um, you know, non-Northern, uh, should we say, um, perceptions of alliance and alignment, because I think they look at them very, you know, they, they look at these things quite differently. I mean, during the, the Cold War, you saw South Africa practice some, you know, some Western forms of like non-aggression pact and, and various um, other alignments with it. Um, with its close neighbors and everything. Um, and then you saw some of the, um, um, you know, you, um, you, you saw, you know, alliances in the Middle East and, and, and this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, does anyone really know what uh, sort of, you know, Nigeria's perspective is on alliance and alignment? I don't think, you know, don't, I mean, they may well have some, you know, some sort of uh, alignments or agreements with, with neighboring states or other states, or, you know, this could be a fascinating area to explore further, um, to juxtapose it to what, you know, is the sort of the, you know, the currently the sort of the, the, the central focus of, of the knowledge we have. So it's a great um, question uh, issue to bring up, and I, I'm, I apologise that I can't give a very specific answer on on, on the um, the AU because I, I just don't know enough off the top of my head. Thank you, Thomas. Absolutely understandable. I just would like to say that in the chat we have a comment on that question, and uh, our participant mentions that indeed, uh, according to the Alliance Treaty obligations and provisions data set, the African Union does not seem to qualify as an alliance. However, within Africa, there are sub-regional alliances and they're also given uh, as an example. Um, okay, I would like to see if there are any more questions from the audience. I do not see in the Q&A or in the chat any specific questions. I wanted perhaps as, uh, as a final one to, to ask a question on something that Thomas really knows very well, the US, Japan, Australia, uh, and in particular Japan, Australia. Um, what do you see, how do you see the likely evolution of on the one hand, the bilateral Japan, Australia, which are kind of one step a little bit away from crossing over to alliance? And yet that step seems to be, you know, maybe big and long. And on the other hand, the trilateral, how do you see the, that evolution? Yeah, yeah, no, those are, those are really um, important um, topics. And uh, again, ones that I've looked at fairly closely. Now, on the trilateral strategic dialogue between um, Australia, Japan, and the United States, um, 
there's very little information out there. I mean, they actually, um, I think, you know, I was looking at it, looking at it the other day and um, they sort of, um, they published a, a kind of a joint declaration from whenever their last meeting was, so maybe a year or two ago, I can't remember exactly. Um, and it basically sort of seems to cover everything, but it, it covers everything but tells you nothing. Like, what are they really doing, right? Because I think, you know, what you advertise to your, you know, with these very, very small, mini lateral exclusive groupings where, where others are not, let, let in and you've got three very very close um um closely aligned countries um um in that in that trilateral strategic dialogue i mean what they're probably doing is a lot more um you know sort of hard security stuff beyond what is advertised and sort of you know hedging and uh, you know i don't maybe i should won't use that word hedging actually but um sort of uh, you know sort of uh, subliminally preparing for you know for greater interoperability and everything you know often through you know through the guise of uh non-traditional security cooperation or you know um uh, you know for some reason um japan and and these other countries australia and everything seem to love humanitarian assistance disaster relief and you know it's incredibly altruistic of them but it's also super useful for building military interoperability um under the guise of non-traditional security that you know few people could argue with um so so the way actually you know i can conceptually describe that um that that trilateral strategic dialogue is and it's very interesting for a little bit of a test of our, our conceptualizing of alliance and alignment because what you've got is the united states is um is is the hub and then um and then um canberra and tokyo are our spokes and so technically um the spokes themselves are quasi allied in victor charles terms and because they have a joint alliance partner so that sort of brings them together in quasi alliance as, as the term is um but then they've also like built up that connection between the two of them bilaterally um to turn it into a in, into a genuine triangle um through the australia japan strategic partnership um also whether or not you know and this is another thing that just perhaps crops up while you mentioned that was you know i just wonder what degree like some of these alliances and alignments are going to uh, overlap because this is a good example of overlap you've got a trilateral context and then you've got individual sets of bilateral contexts like both alliances and strategic partnerships and you see the same thing in the quad as well it's a mix of all of these different connections um all in this kind of network mini minilateral for the australia uh, japan strategic partnership yeah there's some the, the, there's you know some some fairly powerful advocates for um signing a formal alliance treaty of uh, whether or not this you know as a, with the caveat that i said that you know maybe this is about outdated to do this and and not unnecessarily provocative i mean i can just imagine the you know the diplomatic response of, of beijing to this the, like the shower that we'll receive in in canberra um, and, and tokyo if if such a thing happened but maybe you don't need to need to do do that maybe you can just you know um you can build up to a sort of uh sort of to, to such a level that you could toggle into an alliance like very very quickly based upon all of the different connections that you built up you know across the whole spectrum of you know consultations you know uh um military interoperability or all, all this kind of thing and you know you can also build this up within multilateral contexts and everything as well you know it's a, it's a nice way of doing it um so you know some people have argued that we need this formal alliance but actually maybe the strategic partnership is sufficient there's no point in ratcheting up the tensions or basically just you know signing uh signing our lives away it's also um, possibly a little um unrealistic as well because i mean what are australia and japan going to do by themselves as as alliance partners in a military conflict that wouldn't involve the united states anyway so you know it's almost a you know um it's an important question but also a little bit of a moot question because when you put the us in there and the trilateral strategic dialogue you pretty much got it got that alliance anyway wonderful okay uh, thanks a lot, Thomas. Uh, I think, yes, on that note, it's uh, almost 10.30, 10.29 here in, in Belgium. So uh, we will... Uh, ah, yeah, there is one question actually from a student of mine, Thomas. I will uh, use that opportunity to ask. She asks, what could be the factors making China rethink the need for dependable partners? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, China has been called the lonely superpower, and uh, you know, Tongi uh, rightly alluded to the fact that um, it doesn't have a lot of um, you know 
partners slash allies or even friends these days um you know because of the uh you know the all of the the diplomatic spats that it has it's ended up with in virtually every country of significance so what it has is this sort of like you know very kind of low-key set of strategic partnerships with um you know with you know, many countries in the developing world and everything but i mean those countries aren't going to rush to china's assistance and, and fight a war and it doesn't need them anyway but um but you know it's deficiency in in partners with the you know with the russia thing being separate um you know i think um russia is the best that uh that, that china's got at the moment and it, it you know in some ways it's sort of a quad still a quasi great power superpower so you know it's good and also by being in such close partnership um a almost an alliance with russia it also of course denies russia's strategic gravitas and location to either nato or the or, or Asian allies such as Japan or something, and so it secures its kind of rear area. So, in, in the best you know way of looking at the relationship with Russia, if even if Russia wouldn't pull China's chestnuts out of the fire, if it came to a conflict, it might sit back and say, "Okay, just let you get on with it, destroy yourselves." Right? I mean, cynically speaking, um, but is to neutralize Russia as a potential alliance partner for Japan. Or for the United States. I mean, at one point, you know, we of course we had Trump, you know, was wooing Russia, and that, and that was actually completely sensible, right? It would have been an enormously valuable asset, you know, but obviously incredibly difficult given the ideological disconnect. Um, and then I think, you know, um, China keeps um, North Korea as an ally. Um, China is, is, you know, as a technical ally, treaty ally. Um, and it sort of sees like North Korea as like, oh, well, you know, it's a lot of trouble to have North Korea. I mean, it's maybe it's, you know, you know. but on the other hand, you know, they've got certain, new, certain nuclear and, and, and conventional capabilities that make them dangerous and, and, you know, add some capability if that was needed for, for China. But at the same time, they just keep the US alliance system and particularly North Korea, uh, South Korea, sorry, pinned down and contained so that it can add its its weight to the to balancing against China. So. I think you know there's a lot of thinking going on in, in China saying, well, you know, we're pretty much you know um, you know a rising superpower now, but oh boy, when you know when you when you look at you know what our alliance and defense networks look like, these are nothing compared to the United States, and so we're never going to catch up with them um, unless we can win people over. Of course, they just alienated India, which might have been you know potential at least sort of tacit ally or something. Um, but they are, of course, you know, working on this Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which is a very, very bizarre thing, but allows you know China to expand its reach into Central Asia, um, but also. Um, you know, perhaps just sort of keeps like India and oh well, there's Pakistan as well. I forgot. Yeah, there's Pakistan. I mean, there's they often talk about that relationship being an alliance, um, and so that's a great way for for China to keep India pinned down from you know from from behind to its uh, to it, to its west. So um, so maybe actually the picture isn't quite as grim for for China um, as it looks, but I can't see them winning over um, any any new allies in the the immediate term um, until you know they have something you know that. Um, uh, can be appealing or you know or reassure or you know any of these countries and that that's that's not going to happen in the in in the immediate term i don't think but um yeah there's a lot to lot to think about on china and it's worth looking at more closely so that's that's good to provoke some thought on that okay thank you thomas and uh, fantastic question and at the end obviously the fact that the united states has so many allies as also Tangi pointed out, as Thomas engaged and, and China does not have, and alliances obviously are an extension, they give you an extension of state power to, to a large extent. So that is an important point. And I think, I'm afraid here, we will have to end this fantastic discussion. We could go on for hours, obviously, because the topic is absolutely so important and things are uh, evolving uh, conceptually. There, empirically, there are so many new developments are happening, which is hard even sometimes to follow. In any case, I think this is certainly to be continued in our future research in our publications and, and scholarly uh, engagements. Uh, I would like to thank very much uh, Thomas, uh, also Tangi, uh, for your uh, intervention as well. Uh, to our audience, uh, of course, for being present, for asking these fantastic questions, intellectually stimulating discussion, uh, really great to start a Friday, the last day uh, of the week here in Europe. And of course, uh, Uxia, uh, certainly for the organization for the help of the organization of this event. We really hope that next year we will have a chance for an in-person conference. 
uh, we really hope that in the year's time there will be opportunities for Swinery to meet uh, in person. And I see Stain is back. Uh, would you like to say anything at the end or shall we conclude here, Stain? I think we can conclude here. So it was a very nice webinar. Thank you for your contributions. And indeed, uh, Elena, we, we look forward to meeting in uh, live, uh, in physical form, I would say. So see you later and uh, have a nice day uh, or a good night. So thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Thomas. Bye bye. Thank, yeah. you. thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye, -bye. bye, Tom. Bye. 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 Bye.